Ruth here from runhappierpt.com. Um, today we're going over hip flexor mobility. So there are a lot of similarities between the hamstrings, which we covered in the last video, and the hip flexors, which we're going to cover today. Um, there are three hamstrings. There are essentially three hip flexors, three main ones. Um, these muscles run from um, above the hip, so one of them actually starts on the spine, the front side of the lower spine. Um, one starts from inside the pelvis, uh, and then one starts from the front of the pelvis, and then they run across the hip joint. Unlike the hamstrings, where most of the hamstrings cross both the hip joint and the knee joint, only one of the hip flexors crosses both the hip joint and the knee joint. That's the rectus femoris that starts um, on the front of the pelvis and then runs straight down the front of the thigh and attaches over the knee bone. Uh, the other two hip flexors just cross the hip joint. So the hip flexors are mostly active when running during the swing phase. They're what drive the leg um, from behind your body up to in front of your body to prepare for landing. So working together, they flex the hip. They also, with the rectus femoris, extend the knee. Um, so they're very active through the mid-swing portion. And then right at the end of swing phase, they kind of shut off. And then the rectus femoris is really active again during the landing and loading response um, to keep your knee from collapsing into flexion. Uh, and then they kind of turn on again eccentrically, which we talked about last time as well, eccentric contractions being where the muscle is actively contracting, but it's also being stretched at the same time. So they're working eccentrically uh, at the end of stance phase and the first start of swing phase. As your leg is coming behind you, they're working to control that extension of the hip and the flexion of the knee. And then they reverse and start working again through swing phase to kind of pull your leg um, from that middle swing through to the end. Uh, so they, once again, um, with the rectus being a two joint or biarthroidal muscle, um, it gets stretched across the hip when the hip extends and also gets stretched across the knee when the knee flexes. Um, in running, you really only get at the end of push off, the start of swing phase, you really only get to about five degrees of hip extension and about 20 to 30 degrees of knee flexion, kind of depending on how fast you're running. Um, whereas the hip joint itself should normally have about 20 degrees of extension. Um, so here again, like the hamstrings, you don't need really the full range of movement that you have or should have <laughs> at that joint uh, to run. And then two, they're also like the hamstrings working eccentrically at their most extended or elongated position to control that extension. And that's a very quick uh, eccentric to concentric um, contraction. So the issues that we see with hip flexors are kind of similar to the issues that we see um, with hamstrings. So if you don't have enough hip extension, if your hip flexor mobility is lacking, there are some different compensations that you would expect to see. Um, either the pelvis is going to have to move um, or you're just not going to get the leg back behind you. So when you're running, if you don't have enough hip extension, which is going to be that movement there, and you should have normally about 20 degrees of hip extension. You only need about five degrees to run. Uh, but if you do not have that movement there, then what you'll expect to see is either a forward tilting of the pelvis, and increased arching or extension of the lumbar spine, or a kind of rotating of the pelvis in order to get that leg back behind you. Or you just won't. You'll see the leg come to it right underneath you, and then that's it'll start back over. If it if you don't have um, if you don't get enough hip extension during your normal stride, you tend to overstride or be more at risk of overstriding out in front. So one of the other PTs um, who's done a lot of running research and worked with a lot of high level athletes, um, Jay Desherry, I've talked about him before, but he talks about like a pendulum of your swing and it's gonna stay pretty much the same, but it can shift depending on where your mobility and stability and power are coming from. So ordinarily you want it to be about here, but if you don't have that hip extension, it just kind of shifts that pendulum of swing 
and puts you more at risk of overstriding. Now there's things besides just hip flexor mobility that can prevent you from getting that hip extension. One of those is the shape of your hip joint. Uh, the hip joint itself is kind of a cup in your pelvis and then a ball on the top of your femur that fit together. And that cup can be angled in different directions just based on the way you're built. Uh, so there are people who have the cup angled in such a way that they actually cannot physically extend their hip. Um, there's also runners out there who don't engage their gluteal muscles properly and the gluteal muscles help to really drive that extension and push off back behind you as well. So if you're not engaging those glutes and using them or not strong enough in them, that can limit hip extension during running, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're lacking mobility in your hip flexors. But we're gonna talk about glute strengthening next video, so don't worry about that. Today we're just gonna talk about um, hip flexor mobility. So, uh, and going back to J.D. Sherry, he has probably the best way to self-assess your hip flexor mobility. Uh, here again in the clinic, we usually assess it with you laying flat on your back and you're like hanging off the table and we kind of look at the different ways that your pelvis moves and your back moves and your hip moves um, to see which muscles in particular are tight or limited. Um, but at home, the easiest way to assess and also stretch your hip flexors is in a half kneeling or lunge position. So ideally you would do this in a door frame with your um, kind of your back leg lined up along the door frame um, so that your foot's going to be along the wall. But you can also use a dowel to mimic a door frame. So if I put that dowel, maybe I'll set it to the outside even, back behind my leg. And then, well, I guess I'm going to have to put it back here. So you want the dowel pretty much in line with your back thigh. So you shouldn't really be able to see it right now down at the bottom, but it's basically touching the ground just at the front side of my knee. So it's going to be touching at your buttocks and then also kind of your upper back and head. So from this position, you want to try to tuck your hips under. So thinking about taking that pelvis and kind of tilting it in a, I guess for you that would be a counterclockwise direction, um, so that your back, your lower back flattens and touches that stick or the door frame. Now when you do that, what you're doing is you're taking your hip, which would normally in this position be in a little bit of a flex position, and you're then causing it to extend to a fully neutral or slightly extended position. So if you can do this and you don't feel a lot of tension across the front of the hip or down the thigh, great, you've probably got enough mobility um, in your hip flexors themselves. Maybe look into some other things like glute control, glute, glute strengthening, if you're having trouble with getting that leg behind you. But if in this position you feel a strong pull right across the hip flexor crease, which is up at the hip joint, this is a great way to stretch those muscles that come across that hip joint. Um, remember, if you're going to be stretching them, trying to increase the length of those muscles, you need to hold it for at least a minute, four to six days a week, um, for about three months before you really get any change of muscle length. But this position is a great way to stretch it, and also because you can kind of play around with the position a little bit to target different muscles. So I think I already talked about, you've got your psoas muscle, which actually starts on the front side of your lumbar vertebra and then crosses the hip. You've got your um, iliacus muscle, which starts inside of your pelvis and then crosses the hip. Uh, and then another one that kind of contributes is your tensor fascia lata, which is not a primary hip flexor, but a kind of a secondary one. Um, and it starts from the um, front of your pelvis and then connects into your IT band. So, from this position, if I bring that same arm as my back leg up and kind of reach over, I can get a deeper stretch on my psoas muscle. If I take my back foot and let it kind of cross over, I can target that iliopsoas tendon a little more, rectus femoris a little, a little bit. If I let the foot come a little bit towards the outside, I can target my tensor fascia a lot a little bit. So, based on what position you feel the most tension, you can kind of target that stretch to get the most bang for your buck. If you feel more of a pull down the front of the thigh, then most likely it is your rectus femoris that's limited. And so for that guy, you can either stay
in that same kneeling position and use a hand or a strap to grab your back foot, pull it up towards your buttocks. Um, but really the best way to stretch out that rectus femoris is actually laying flat on your stomach, which I can't do right now. But if you imagine that I'm laying flat on my stomach and I use a strap or my hand to pull my foot up towards my buttocks. Um, you can do it standing, but there's a lot of ways that you can cheat in standing by letting the knee come in front, letting the back arch, um, letting the pelvis open up or tilt. Um, so it's just easier if you can do it laying flat on your stomach. You can't cheat as easily that way. Um, similarly to the hamstrings, because those hip flexors are working eccentrically um, really quickly at that position of maximum stretch, uh, doing some uh, soft tissue work, some um, self-myofascial release, foam rolling kind of stuff can also be really helpful to target those connected tissues surrounding and involved with the muscles. So, foam rolling for the hip flexors, pretty standard stuff. You want to roll all the way from just below those pointy hip bones to the top of the kneecap. just at the hip flexor crease and then rolling all the way down to the kneecap and then back up. The rectus runs pretty much straight down the front of the thigh but the quad as a whole has connections into the inside of the thigh with some of the adductors and also towards the outside of the thigh and that into the IT band. So um, as you're rolling in this position, you might as well take the time to angle the leg such that you're rolling along kind of the outside of the front of the thigh by pointing that toe in. And then also the opposite, point the toe out and get along the inside of the thigh a little bit. To get more of the iliopsoas tendon, if you roll all the way back till you're you kind of let the um, foam roller sink into the space between the pointy hip bone on the front of your hip and your thigh bone. There's kind of a little dip there. So if you let the foam roller just sink down into that dip and let the leg relax, you can see I've got my knee resting down on the floor. That leg is just really relaxed. That's a good way to put pressure on that iliopsoas tendon and insertion and is a good way to kind of work some of the tension out of that guy. You can rock in and out with it if that feels good. You can also use a smaller diameter roller or a ball um, to get deeper in there. But I found this works pretty well for me. All right, um, I don't think I gave my disclaimer at the beginning, so I'll toss it in now. Um, this video was intended for information only. While I am a licensed doctor of physical therapy, I'm not your physical therapist. Um, therefore, this video is not intended to diagnose, treat, prevent, or cure any injury or illness. And I highly recommend that you consult with your healthcare provider prior to starting any new exercise to make sure it's appropriate for you. I'll include the references for this video in the notes section, as always. And if you have any questions or comments, head on over to the website, shoot me an email, or head to our Facebook or Instagram pages. Thanks for watching.